production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. PNC, committed to Central Ohio, for the achiever in you. From these contributing sponsors and viewers like you, thank you. This time on Broad and High, a Columbus artist shares the silent afflictions of her handcrafted dolls. Then we'll visit a doll museum in Worthington, learn about the hidden mothers of 19th century photography. Well, we're looking at a very scary American horror story. And get some makeup tips suitable for all the zombies in your life. This and more right now on Broad and High. Hi everyone, welcome to Broad and High. I'm your host, Kate Quickle. Columbus artist and doll maker Amber Groom says she both loathes and adores each of her handmade figurines. In this story, she takes us along on her journey of creation, from the initial clay that gives them their shape, to the decorative bits of ephemera that give them meaning, to the little box houses that give them a place to belong. Along the way, she shares the silent afflictions of the members of her collection, and gives us insight into where she fits among them. beautiful yet grotesque in a lot of ways. They started out very angsty, but they've evolved to be more of a whimsical sort of thing. Uh, they display a wide array of human emotions. They are a bit dark. A lot of people find them creepy. Uh, that I don't mind. <laughs> I started very young drawing. Uh, I've always been inclined to artistic uh, endeavors. My mom always encouraged it. It was a voice for me. Um, I found that I identified through other people's artwork. I could really find my voice in other people's artwork and I feel like that is a sacred communication with an artist and a viewer. I start out by sculpting the head, uh, put together the body, it's all formed around a toothpick. Um, they're meticulously sculpted, then I put them in the oven and fire them. assortment of lace remnants and little objects, found objects that I use that for all to come together in detail. Uh, they're painted, um, the hair is applied, I construct the outfits. I think that the act of doing them is very ritualistic for me. It is very calming and soothing to get involved in the detail. Uh, it acts almost as a catharsis in a lot of ways for some of the emotions that I'm bringing up and showing and portraying in the dolls. I decide what goes into a piece by my found objects and assortments of collections, little musings that are inspiring to me. I scoured thrift stores, flea markets, antique shops. A lot of people even donate little objects to me that they think that I'll like. I 
I really like to indulge in my aesthetic, so a lot of the things that you see around me are collected through antique shops and whatnot. Um, it's very important for me to surround myself with inspiring objects. I'm represented by the Lindsay Gallery. Um, it's a wonderful gallery. Uh, they represent folk art and outsider art. Uh, it's my home base. I feel very comfortable there. I enjoy the other artists that are shown there. Duff Lindsay is an incredible <laughs> representative for my work. Uh, I first brought it to him probably about six years ago, and he immediately saw value in him and had faith in the artwork. So I'm very happy to be there. I enjoy showing the artwork and identifying with other people. Uh, I've had a lot of women that particularly identify with the work that have even come to me in tears um, <laughs> expressing. And that's the most amazing thing to me, to be able to touch someone like that with the artwork. Uh, that would be the reason why I do it the most and why I enjoy it the most. From the safety pins to the pine cones, there are many meanings behind the symbols Amber places in her doll boxes. Check out her artist page at lindsaygallery.com to learn more about their significance. Nestled in historic downtown Worthington, the Doll Museum at the Old Rectory features an impressive collection of 19th and 20th century dolls. With portrait dolls modeled after European monarchs and French fashion dolls with wigs made of real hair, this charming little museum is one of Worthington's hidden treasures. Well, it's a wonderful collection of 19th century dolls and has some very unusual dolls that can't be seen in many other places at all. And together, it's a nice little jewel. We get all kinds of cheers from doll collectors, but we get a lot of oohs and ahs from kindergartners too. <laughs> well, the earliest ones are the ones that uh, were made of wood in Germany. The Germans were the toy makers for the Western world initially, so we have some very early small ones that we call penny woodens or peg woodens, and we have some portrait dolls, some china dolls, some Parian china dolls. Um, the French fashions are probably the elite of this group, and then we have some American dolls that were made by Isanna Walker and Joel Ellis, people that are big names in American doll making early on. A portrait doll is a doll that is made in the image of a real person. So for all the kids who come here and have American Girl dolls, there are wonderful stories about these dolls, but they weren't real people. The dolls over there uh, include the Empress Eugenie, who was married to Napoleon III, the Kaiserin Augusta von Weimar, the Empress of Germany, and there's Countess Dagmar, whom we associate with the Tsar of Russia. Um, and there's Alice in Wonderland, too, who, even though she's a, a literary character, reflects a real person's life. So those are the ones we typically have the kids looking for. The Alice kind of shocks them because she doesn't look like Disney's Alice. A Parian doll uh, refers to the Parian marbles that were being used for sculpture at that time and so they will have pierced ears, sometimes they'll have an embellishment. They were fired twice and therefore much more expensive than the china dolls that have the very shiny faces. We have a wishbone doll and the wishbone doll is the earliest Worthington doll that we have and uh, it was made on a turkey wishbone so it was found floating in the mud of the cellar of the Orange Johnson house at the time that the society uh, was going to restore the house. These are the French fashion dolls, and they are the fanciest ladies on the block. Um, these dolls had every stitch of clothing that a lady of fashion would want to be wearing in Paris. This is uh, the ladies 
a toiletry case and so it's made out of leatherette with little uh, mother of pearl decorations and inside is all the, the items that might be needed if you're going traveling. Your perfume bottles, your bath sponge, kids always like to know that this is a 140 year old bar of soap and uh, here we have the brushes which includes her lice comb which every lady would be needing in bed time period. And the fun thing is to look at the label on the back and notice that it's from the toy store Onam Bleu, um, which is still in existence in Paris today. The Isana Walker is the treat and the treasure of the doll museum. Um, she is a beautiful doll. She was made by a lady doll maker named Isana Walker and she made these cloth dolls uh, that she fashioned herself and her sister hand painted them. So everything about the doll is original from her dress to her little red shoes and all the things she wears underneath. The Isana Walker dolls are very treasured among American doll collectors. And she's very sweet. Her name is Thankful and it's just a wonderful name for this beautiful little doll. We sometimes have doll houses. We have a huge doll house collection. We also have uh, any number of other e exhibitions that are sometimes borrowed from other collectors in the area, and in this case, uh, ones that are from our collection with a collector's dolls are being displayed. And it kind of allows us to look at one facet at a time. Uh, occasionally, someone will call us and they'll have a treasured item that they would like to see preserved and shared. And so if it fits in our collection, which does go into the 20th century now, but uh, if it fits in our collection, then it comes and it's on permanent vacation here. The Doll Museum at the Old Rectory is open to the public Tuesday through Friday from 1 to 4 and Saturdays from 10 to 2. Learn more at worthingtonhistory.org. Now we go from 19th century dolls to 19th century photography. It was a time when the art form was still in its infancy, and images had to be exposed for long durations before being captured on film. That long exposure time meant people had to remain perfectly still to avoid a blurry photograph. And back then, children were just as squirmy as they are today. So some folks would go to interesting lengths to try to keep a child still during a photo shoot, which could result in some rather unsettling and haunting images. Here's more about the hidden mother phenomenon. Albert Ewing was born in 1870. He was born in Lowell, Ohio, which is in the southeastern part of the state. He became a photographer in 1896 and photographed until 1912. Hidden mothers, well, how would you, at that time, when you had to sit still for at least 15 seconds, record an image of a child? And if you moved, it would be blurry, or you would just get a streak. So what Ewing did was what any clever photographer would do, is cover the caretaker, the mother, the father, whoever it was, with a blanket, and then put the baby or the child right on their lap. And then, in the dark room, he could actually sort of crop out that blanketed figure in the back and you would look like you just had the baby there and people would wonder how, how the baby just laid still. Well, we're looking at a very scary American horror story <laughs> of a blanketed figure and three children. Really though, it is a mom under a blanket who's probably keeping her children calm. And you notice it's a dark material. So probably what he's going to do in the dark room, or what he did do, is make the entire background black. So all you would see is the kids. And then of course you crop out the legs. So if you go from say the shins up, you could actually um, see how you could create a nice little photograph of the three kids in that particular image without mom there. Yeah, I think it's, um, it's Ewing's blanket and you can kind of see her hands holding the baby there. To me what's, what's interesting is um, if you think about what he had to go through in the dark room to kind of get rid of the hands near the baby or turn that plaid blanket into something that was black. 
That would have been the art of developing. And you know, even in this one, they probably had to redo it because the baby was not very happy. So what they did here is they covered the chair with the blanket and it looks like mom or whoever, could be older sister, could be grandmother, is kneeling in the back and you can see her bonnet. The way that uh, they're able to keep her calm is by actually sticking her hands through the blankets and then just holding her there. But he's probably, he probably, when he made the print, he probably cropped out the feet because the feet kind of look funny. They have a foreshortening there that doesn't really work. And he probably just kept the bib around the top and then cropped out the top and then came in and it probably looked like a studio shot. In the 1890s or the early 1900s was the first time that regular folks would be able to pay a quarter, a dime or whatever it was to get a picture of each of their children. So in the early days you see more family portraits, you don't really see pictures of individuals in the family. This was the first time where people could afford it. Let's move on to a less creepy style of photography and one that is decidedly more modern. It's autumn and that means it's the perfect time to capture the beauty of the changing landscape. Columbus photographer Rick Buchanan shows us how and where he goes to capture the finest scenery nature has to offer. Well, we're here at Upper Falls in the Old Man's Cave region of Hocking Hills. Hocking Hills is really a magical place. Um, people, you hear a lot, of people say, oh, Ohio, it's boring, it's flat, there's no pretty landscape, no mountains, no oceans. Well, there's no mountains or oceans, but we do have beautiful landscapes, and I think Hogging Hills is the nicest in the state. Um, when you get down there at the right time, it's just, it's gorgeous. We got a decent amount of water coming over the falls today. I've set up a shot here that I kind of like because the uh, hemlock branches are framing the falls nicely. Hopefully we'll end up with an image that's one that isn't seen every day. I try to travel as light as I can when I'm out in the field. Um, just tripod, two or three lenses, camera body. This is the devil's bathtub. Sometimes there's some cool compositions down in here, depending upon how much water's flowing. It's a little light today. I started my career in the advertising business and worked in that for 16 years and picked up photography as a hobby along the way. And um, so I slowly made a transition over the course of a couple years from the advertising agency business to photography and um, really never looked back. Well, I like to tell people that I photograph people and places. Uh, so a lot of my work is portraiture and then I photograph quite a bit of events. And then uh, I also do a lot of landscape and nature photography. Well, right now we're down here at the Cascade, which are right above Middle Falls. And um, getting some nice light coming through, streaming through the trees, getting a little bit of light beams and nice reflections on the water. Um, using a really slow shutter speed here to um, add motion to the water and get that nice cotton candy kind of feel to it. I usually go to Colorado every fall. It's probably my favorite place to photograph. I just love it out there. One of my favorite subjects to photograph are aspen trees. There's just so much personality to them. Uh, the trunks, the leaves, the way they change, the way they look in the spring, the way they look in the fall, the way they look in the summer. Um, plus it's just, it's just great to be out there in the mountain air with them. So I print all my own work here in the studio and I use an Epson 7880. It's a large format printer. It's capable of printing um, 24 inches wide by, I don't know, six or eight feet long. 
I think one of the hallmarks of my photography is detail. I really like a lot of detail in my images and my prints. Uh, when you get out there in nature, it's great to get away from the hustle and bustle. I find it's a very invigorating way to, to kind of recharge the battery, so to speak, and give me a creative spark in, in my commercial work. Well, it is Halloween night, so enjoy this next story featuring special effects artist Todd Reed, who will tell us everything we need to know about, well, zombie makeup. She needs one. Who wants to do it? You guys are done. Which one of you guys want to volunteer to give Lee a black eye? Yeah, we can sober. Yeah, there you go. Lee, you're going, you're going to give you a black eye, too. All right? It's always good. Always good. The more black eyes, the better. Well, I guess you can only have two, so you're kind of limited, not unless you're a triclops. <laughs> yeah. Columbus College of Art and Design was uh, nice enough to allow me to come in and teach the students uh, practical special effects makeup for uh, movies or photo shoots. Uh, it's the only course that we know of that's offered in the state of Ohio uh, for college or high school level students. When I, I started out, I grew up in the 80s and I grew up, you know, like what I call the golden age of uh, special effects. And I really wanted to get into it when I was a kid. However, uh, there weren't classes that were offered to, especially kids my age or anybody in the state of Ohio, you had to go all the way to the West Coast, which is primarily the problem now with anybody wanting to pursue this in Ohio. So we have, um, in the summertime, we do a five day uh, it's a one-week, five-day course, uh, zombie making workshop. And then this one is a 10-week course, so we get to extend on a lot more stuff. Burns, uh, a lot more uh, airbrushing, latex, uh, prosthetic, fabrication. So it's a little bit more intense on this one because we have a little bit more time to work with students. So first, we bruised each other's eyes with like these uh, bruising palettes. And then after that, we made open wounds <laughs> with latex and coffee grounds and corn syrup. It's nice that CCAD has the classes because my high school doesn't do special effects makeup and they don't have that many art classes. So it's like cool to have the opportunity to come here and do it. And the reason why I want you guys to do this on each other is because the only way you'll be a good special effects artist is if you've been on the other side of that makeup. You know what's uncomfortable. You know what you don't like. Be like, man, I was sitting in a chair, this guy is like dabbing my eyeball, you know, and his breath was stinking, you know what I mean? I think it's a great program because, like, someone like me who's in middle school, it works because we're able to come here on the weekends and learn about art and, like, different types of art that we may not learn about in school. Um, I've showed pictures to my science class at school. They all thought it was super cool. So I'm definitely going to continue doing this class. I find that teaching adults is fun. Teaching anybody special effects is fun. The cool thing about doing it with the kids is um, the kids are really open to learning new things and they have real open minds and they have a different uh, outlook on creativity. Maybe kind of fresh set of eyes to something old and they bring something new to it every time. They inspire me. You know, sometimes when I'm in class, they do stuff and I go, wow, we kind of stumbled onto something there. Maybe I could use this in something that I'm doing too, you know? So it's a learning experience for both of us at the same time. And you know, special effects makeup, you've never done learning. That's our show. You can find all of our stories at WOSU.org or on our free WOSU public media mobile app. And be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We're closing out the show today with a tune called Ghosts in the Graveyard by Columbus Band Fool's Fire. From all of us here at WOSU, we wish you a happy Halloween. I'm Kate Quickle. Thanks for watching. We'll see you back here next week. Keep
Cecilia C. Peters, film and visual art. I'm a science, math, theoretical physics fiend. My art is bold, colorful, and geometric. It's science fiction. I love building characters and their worlds. I love the process of putting a story together visually, getting a polished film from raw materials. I'm inspired by the very diverse, very unpredictable Midwestern sensibility that lives in the arts community here. Ohio artists are notorious for being insanely innovative and they go for it in every conceivable way. I'm Celia C. Peters, film is my art, and there's no place I'd rather make it. Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. PNC, committed to Central Ohio, for the achiever in you. From these contributing sponsors, and viewers like you, thank you.